So good afternoon, my dear students. Uh, this situation is uh, rather different uh, from the one we are accustomed to. We are just some minutes uh, after the normal beginning uh, of uh, our class, uh, our course uh, entitled uh, Introduction to Reading of uh, the Bible. Uh, as you surely know, uh, we cannot uh, meet personally, probably for quite a long time, uh, which means uh, that uh, at least uh, this week and uh, the next week uh, I will uh, send you uh, a video uh, record uh, of the lecture uh, which I am going uh, to give. Uh, after it we shall have uh, in fact uh, three whole years, uh, the three whole weeks uh, when uh, there will be no, uh, no occasion, no class for us, and we shall see uh, what comes uh, after. Uh, it might be possible that uh, we should be able uh, to uh, make a, a similar uh, class, but in real time. Uh, I mean at the exact uh, time when we usually begin uh, our uh, lecture, then uh, you will be able uh, to uh, be in uh, the program. So anyway, uh, if uh, you remember, uh, we reached uh, at the end of the previous class uh, the prophets. Uh, prophecy, uh, which we can say is perhaps uh, the most characteristic phenomena uh, of uh, the Old uh, Testament uh, uh, world and the Old Testament religion and the Old Testament uh, uh, religiosity. Uh, at least uh, as far as uh, uh, the Christian understanding uh, uh, of the Bible is concerned. And uh, we uh, can say that uh, uh, it is hardly possible uh, for us uh, to speak about the Bible uh, without uh, at least to a certain extent uh, uh, identify yourself uh, with uh, a point of view from where we look uh, at uh, the texts uh, of the Bible. However, uh, if we speak about the Old Testament, it is always important uh, uh, to have in our mind that there is a possibility uh, of the reading of these texts uh, from a Christian point of view, uh, also uh, from a Jewish point of view, and then uh, we said that uh, as far as possible uh, we should try uh, to speak about these texts uh, so as uh, modern uh, research, uh, historic and literary research uh, makes it possible uh, for us. Anyway, so we reached the point uh, uh, where the prophets uh, uh, appear in uh, the history of the Old Testament religion. Uh, which is uh, in the age uh, of the kings, uh, of the two kingdoms, you might remember, uh, after a short period uh, of David and uh, King Solomon, uh, the uh, Jewish kingdom uh, was separated uh, in two parts. The northern one uh, was Israel and the southern one uh, was uh, Judah. Uh, and uh, then uh, we could say about from the 7th century uh, there appear the prophets uh, at least uh, uh, in the form uh, as we know them uh, from uh, the later understanding. It is important to emphasize this because uh, uh, there will be called uh, prophets uh, almost everybody in the Old Testament. Uh, you, might, uh, you might find uh, some places uh, uh, where it is spoken about Moses uh, as a prophet. However, it has to be quite clear uh, that uh, the phenomenon of uh, Moses is something very different uh, from uh, what is the prophets. Now, uh, to, to sum up uh, very briefly uh, what we said at the very end of uh, the previous class about the prophets, uh, we can say that, uh, first of all, uh, they were persons uh, who uh, were on the periphery uh, of uh, the society and of the state. Uh, they were legitimate and uh, not legitimate. Uh, we said uh, that, on the one hand, there was whole, the whole uh, state and uh, uh, church, with uh, today's words, religious infrastructure, 
uh, with all the priests, uh, with the church, uh, with uh, uh, quite a lot of uh, rulings uh, and, uh, and cult. And then there were the prophets who represented uh, the word of uh, God, an actual word of God uh, to the people. Uh, which also meant uh, that the prophets uh, usually were in uh, quite uh, a tension uh, with uh, the then uh, ruling uh, political and uh, religious uh, persons, uh, with the king uh, and with the high priest, etc., etc. Uh, the second important point was uh, that the prophets, uh, especially uh, in the first uh, two centuries, uh, more or less, we could say. So in the first centuries uh, of their existence, which was before uh, the Babylonian captivity, they uh, made a very, very hard religious and social critic of their time's uh, society. A religious uh, critic of which the essence was that Israel became unfaithful uh, to uh, her God. And uh, also a social critic uh, saying uh, that there is horrible injustice in the society. Uh, in fact, uh, all possible critics, which, which are general, when we speak about uh, uh, society, it was there uh, in the prophecies uh, of uh, these persons. A third important, important characteristic uh, of prophecy was uh, that it was a very strong uh, and poetic language. Even, uh, we shall see it in some minutes, uh, it was not only speaking, but sometimes it was uh, acting. It was actions, uh, symbolic actions, uh, by which the prophets uh, expressed uh, uh, their message or put it more correctly, the message of God, of uh, the Lord. And then, uh, to tell you, uh, here at the very beginning, in speaking about the prophets, uh, we can say uh, that uh, perhaps a uh, uh, historically uh, very important, if not the most important consequence uh, of prophecy uh, was that when the national tragedy arrives uh, and uh, the people uh, of Israel uh, is uh, in exile, uh, is uh, in the Babylonian uh, captivity, it will not mean the end uh, of the history of the Old Testament people because uh, uh, they were able to understand, to interpret the tragedy of what happened to them, not as it would have been normal in case of other religions, so to say that our God was not strong enough, but the other way around, saying that this was the punishment of the Lord, of God, because of the unfaithfulness uh, of uh, his people. So that was a brief uh, introduction uh, to speaking about the prophets. And now let's uh, see the texts uh, which you have in the readings. Uh, we shall try to say some words about uh, each of these uh, texts. The first one is uh, uh, from uh, the prophet Isaiah. Uh, you might remember that there are three uh, uh, major prophets, uh, Isaiah, Jeremiah and Ezekiel. Uh, we shall have texts uh, from the first uh, two of these. Uh, they are the major prophets uh, and uh, we had the minor prophets uh, and take care, it doesn't mean that they were not so important persons, it simply means uh, that there is much less text uh, from them than from the major prophets, uh, to which uh, uh, we often count also the prophet uh, Daniel, who however is uh, from a later period uh, of uh, the Old Testament uh, uh, so, uh, we have uh, here uh, one of uh, uh, the famous texts uh, from uh, Isaiah, uh, which runs like this. I will sing for the one I love uh, a song about his vineyard. My loved one had a vineyard on a fertile hillside. 
he dug it up and cleared it uh, of stones and planted it uh, with the choicest wines. He built a watchtower in it and cut out a wine press as well. Then he looked for a crop of good grapes, but it yielded only bad fruit. Now you dwellers in Jerusalem and people of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more could have been done for my vineyard than I have done for it? When I looked for good grapes, why did it yield only bad? Now I will tell you what I am going to do to my vineyard. I will take away its hedge, and it will be destroyed. I will break down its wall, and it will be trampled. I will make it a wasteland, neither pruned nor cultivated, and briars and thorns will grow there. I will command the clouds not to rain on it. The vineyard of the Lord Almighty is the nation of Israel, and the people of Judah are the vines he delighted in, and he looked for justice, but saw bloodshed, for righteousness, but heard cries of uh, distress. Well, I think uh, it's quite clear. It's a parable. Just like the first uh, prophetic word, uh, which we read in the uh, previous uh, class, which was the parable uh, that uh, Nathan uh, told uh, to David. Uh, from this uh, uh, we can uh, think uh, that it's questionable if uh, the uh, uh, person of Nathan is really for the time from the times of David, uh, if it's not uh, from a later time. But uh, now we can uh, leave aside uh, this question and simply say that uh, again here you have a parable uh, which quite clearly speaks uh, about uh, a drama, a real drama in uh, the relation uh, between uh, God and uh, his people. It's a parable and also it is very, very similar to the one we met uh, uh, in case uh, of uh, Nathan and David, uh, what we uh, read in the last verse uh, when uh, it said the vineyard of the Lord Almighty is the nation of Israel. It is absolutely the same uh, as when Nathan says, you are that man, uh, he says it uh, to David. And in this situation, it's uh, not uh, one single person, but it is the whole nation of Israel and Judah, you know, the two kingdoms, uh, so all the people uh, of the Jews, uh, who are called, you are the sinner. And also it is uh, very similar uh, in uh, so far as, uh, if you remember, uh, when Nathan tells the parable uh, to David, then it is David himself, himself uh, who says uh, the judgment, saying that that horrible man uh, must be punished. And it is the same what you see here that uh, the prophet says, uh, uh, let's, uh, let's make the judgment. You should judge yourself uh, what uh, I should do, what uh, more could have been done uh, for the vineyard, for Israel. Uh, and uh, it is themselves uh, who m can and in fact must uh, say uh, the judgment uh, in, this, uh, in this quarrel uh, between uh, God uh, and uh, uh, his people. It is also important uh, to see one more point uh, in this story, which is that uh, what God made uh, was a wonderful, a beautiful uh, vineyard. It is important uh, because, if you remember, we said uh, that uh, when God gives uh, the law to his people, 
it is not something uh, which is, uh, uh, as for us usually, the law is uh, something uh, necessary but not very comfortable. We do not like laws, but uh, perhaps we accept that it's uh, necessary uh, to comply uh, with the laws. Uh, just like now, when there is uh, this uh, uh, this horrible, great problem uh, with the uh, with this virus, uh, uh, with this contamination, and we could say that well, we do not like uh, that uh, we. Have have to change uh, the whole course of our life but perhaps we say okay we understood it uh, it's inevitable but it's uh, uncomfortable that's not the idea of the law in the old testament uh, what you have is uh, there is uh, that it is something beautiful it is the best the very best possibility uh, which ever has been uh, offered uh, to human beings to live according uh, these uh, laws. So God really made everything uh, which is possible in order that his uh, nation, his people, be able to live a good life. However, they did not do it, but they became uh, unfaithful. All right, and then uh, now let's uh, move to another story, uh, which will be that of uh, Jeremiah, because of some reason or another, this doesn't work, doesn't matter, we can use uh, uh, this one, uh, so... Uh, we have... Uh, a very different uh, part uh, from uh, the series of uh, the prophecies of Jeremiah, uh, which uh, is from the very beginning uh, of uh, the book, uh, from chapter 1, uh, the first uh, 10 verses, uh, which uh, is of importance because uh, it uh, it shows you uh, something about the person uh, of uh, the prophets. Uh, in a sense, we could say uh, not only about concretely uh, the person of Jeremiah, but generally about the prophets. And then now again, uh, some introduction to this question. Uh, there has been quite a lot uh, of ways of interpreting uh, the prophets, the prophecy and the persons of the prophets. Uh, and uh, you can imagine uh, that mostly uh, in, uh, in each age, uh, uh, the thinking of that age, the ideas of that, uh, that society determined uh, what image was made about the prophets. Uh, just to tell you two things, uh, one was uh, when uh, uh, the prophets were understood uh, as uh, some exceptionally in intelligent and sensible people uh, who could uh, somehow uh, feel uh, in advance uh, what will come in the future. Or uh, another way of interpretation was uh, that they were very, very intelligent, fantastic politicians. Politicians because uh, generally uh, uh, the, the most important prophecies were about the fate of the country and the fate of the nation. And they said they were uh, like uh, the most intelligent uh, uh, politicians who were able uh, to see the consequences uh, of what was done, who understood so very well the international political uh, uh, situation. And uh, thanks to this knowledge, they were able to say what will come. Now, uh, this has not very much uh, uh, to do uh, with, uh, with, the, uh, with the reality. In the reality, uh, these prophets, uh, I stress it again, uh, were representant uh, uh, of uh, the word of, uh, of the Lord. And uh, it is not necessary uh, that they were uh, so absolutely ingenious uh, persons. But, uh, well, let's see uh, what uh, we have here in the first ten verses uh, of the first chapter of the, the book of Jeremiah. The word of Jeremiah, son of Hilkiah, one of the priests at Anatot in the territory of Benjamin. Benjamin was one of the tribes of the Jews. Uh, 
And uh, here in the first verse, uh, you have something uh, which uh, is a little astonishing, that uh, son of Hilkea, one of the priests at Anathoth. And this, me it, uh, this means that uh, we have uh, to make a little uh, more accurate uh, picture about uh, priest and prophet. We can say uh, very generally that the priests uh, were the religious uh, persons uh, in uh, the uh, 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 in uh, the institution, in the big institution of the religion of, uh, uh, of the Jews. And the prophets were uh, people uh, coming from outside, coming and, uh, and shouting the word of God uh, into the middle of the life of the people. So on the one hand, uh, it is true. On the other hand, it is very changing what sort of people these uh, prophets were. There were among them very, very simple persons, and in other cases, like uh, in that of Jeremiah, he could come from a priestly family. The priests, uh, you know, it was uh, the priestly families, uh, it, uh, it means that uh, it was not the case that somebody decided individually that I will be priest. There were those families uh, who gave the priests uh, to uh, the people. And so Jeremiah was uh, from a priestly family. Uh, it means uh, that uh, among uh, the priests uh, who were the representant uh, of uh, religion, business as usual, uh, even they could become prophets. On the other hand, uh, we shall see it a little later, there were prophets who were uh, somehow assimilated into uh, the uh, infrastructure of the official religion and thereby, thereby they could uh, lose uh, their real capacity as a prophet and they could become false prophets. But we shall see, we'll speak about it a little later. So let's go further. The word of the Lord came to him in the thirteenth year of the reign of Joshua, son of Ammon, king of Judah. And through the reign of uh, Jehoiakim, uh, son of Joshua, king of Judah, down to the fifth month of the eleventh year of Zedekiah, son of Joshua, king of Judah, when the people of Jerusalem went into exile. What is important here to see is uh, that the word of the Lord came to him in the 13th year of the reign of Joshua, and even it could be uh, determined more in detail on which day and when, which means uh, that to be a prophet was not something uh, uh, what, uh, uh, what uh, uh, somebody uh, uh, could uh, arrive at, and then being a prophet all the time, as the prophecy came from God at a concrete actual situation, with a concrete actual message to the people, it happened, and then it could be ended, and perhaps uh, happen again after a year, or five years, or ten years. So uh, this is important uh, to see uh, that uh, everything uh, emphasizes uh, that uh, this was uh, not uh, the word of an individual person, uh, be it uh, uh, as intelligent and good, etc., etc., as you want, uh, but it always was uh, uh, the mediating uh, of uh, the message of uh, the Lord. So, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. It's clear, isn't it? It is a concrete individual decision of the Lord to say that this man will be my prophet. Alas, uh, sovereign Lord, I said, I do not know how to speak. I am too young. You see? 
No word about uh, a very talented person who would be more apt uh, um, uh, for uh, this task than everybody else. No. He is young, he is not uh, a good writer, uh, he is absolutely not the person who would be the best uh, for this task. But the Lord said to me, do not say I am too young, you must go to everyone I send you to and say whatever I command you. He doesn't know what he will have to say. At the moment uh, when it comes, then it will be put on his lips. We shall see it in a minute. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you and will rescue, rescue you, declares the Lord. Do not be afraid of them, uh, which uh, otherwise would be absolutely logical, because uh, you always will get into a horrible tension uh, with the power, uh, with the state and the religious power. But do not be afraid, because I will rescue you. Then the Lord reached out his hand and touched my mouth and said to me, I have put my words in your mouth. That is the essence of prophecy. See, today I appoint you, today, now, I appoint you over nations and kingdoms to uproot and tear down, to destroy and overthrow, to build and to plant. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, and then uh, let's move forward uh, to another prophecy of uh, Jeremiah, which uh, will... Uh, no. uh, I made some mistake uh, in looking for uh, that part. Okay, so we are now... Uh, Yes, that's it, Jeremiah, and uh, we need uh, chapter 4, just a minute, chapter 4, from uh, verse 19 to verse uh, 28. So, Oh, my anguish, my anguish, uh, I writhe in pain. Oh, the agony of my heart. My heart pounds within me. I cannot keep silent, for I have heard the sound of the trumpet. I have heard the battle cry. Disaster follows disaster. The whole land lies in ruins. In an instant my tents are destroyed, my shelter in a moment. How long must I see the battle standard and hear the sound of the trumpet? What is this? It is a vision, no doubt, it is a vision. Something uh, which uh, the prophet sees, what will happen, what will come, and which means for him a horrible suffering. Because what he has to see is uh, something terrible happening to his people, uh, which he loves, which he loves so much, which he would like to see uh, in, in welfare, which he would like to see faithful uh, to his Lord, and he has to see uh, the opposite uh, of all this. So, he sees a, a very, very bad actual situation, and then there is given him this uh, vision about uh, what will come, about uh, the historic uh, disaster uh, of uh, his uh, people. And then, uh, to go further a little, my people are fools, they do not know me. They are senseless children. They have no understanding. They are skilled in doing evil. They know not how to do good. 
I looked at the earth, and it was formless and empty, and at the heavens, and their light was gone. I looked at the mountains, and they were quaking, all the hills were swaying. I looked, and there were no people, every bird in the sky had flown away. I looked, and the fruitful land was a desert. All its towns lay in ruins before the Lord, before his fierce anger. This is what the Lord says. The whole land will be ruined, though I will not destroy it completely. Therefore, the earth will mourn and the heavens above grow dark, because I have spoken and will not relent. I have decided and will not turn back. At the sound of horsemen and archers, every town takes to flight. Some go into the thickets, some climb, climb up among the rocks. All the towns are deserted. No one lives in them. I think it's absolutely clear. It is the punishment uh, of the Lord over his uh, people. And though it is a very, very uh, suffering, it is really uh, the greatest suffering from, for the prophet uh, to say uh, what he says, he has no choice. He has uh, to convey uh, the message of uh, the Lord, which is a, a terrible uh, punishment, a terrible judgment uh, on uh, his uh, people. And then now let's go further to chapter 27. In fact, uh, had we enough time, we should read also uh, chapter 28. It's a, a relatively a long story, not only a uh, what the prophet says, but uh, also it's an action and it's a, a real struggle between Jeremiah and the king Jeremiah and the false prophets I was talking about uh, some minutes ago. So, early in the reign of Zedekiah, son of Josiah, king of Judah, this word came to Jeremiah from the Lord. This is what the Lord said to me, make a yoke out of straps and crossbars and put it on your neck. Then send word to the kings of Edom, Moab, Ammon, Tyre and Sidon through the envoys who have come to Jerusalem to Zedekiah, king of Judah. Give them a message for their masters and say, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. Tell this to your masters. With my great power and outstretched arm, I made the earth and its people and the animals that are on it, and I give it to anyone I please. Now I will give all your countries into the hands of my servant Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. I will make even the wild animals subject to him. Two important remarks here is, uh, first of all, that uh, uh, as we saw, this time it is not only a message uh, to Judah and Israel, but it is also to the nations uh, that lived around uh, Israel. So it means that here we have a concrete uh, example uh, of the message uh, of uh, the prophet, that is the message of uh, the Lord, uh, reaching not only uh, the uh, chosen people, the Jews, but also other people. And we also could see uh, uh, the whole logic behind the whole thing uh, when we read uh, that uh, it was uh, by his hands of the Lord that everything was created. If you remember, we said that the idea of uh, the creation was not the beginning uh, of uh, the religion and of the face of uh, the Old Testament people. It was the other way around. You remember what we said? We said that uh, they had an experience with their God, 
who was only the god of that nation, that people, of the chosen people. And then, uh, as they realized how powerful God is, then they said that uh, it's impossible that he be only the god of our uh, nation, he must be the god of all other nations. And if he is uh, the god of history, then he is not only the god of history, but of the whole universe, uh, of the nature too. And so, uh, then uh, you have here also an interpretation of world history. If we read about Nebuchadnezzar, he really was uh, one of the most important personalities uh, in history, uh, uh, the most uh, powerful uh, king of one of the great uh, empires in history. And this Nebuchadnezzar, however, was only an instrument in the hands of the Lord, according to what uh, we read here. Can you imagine the thing? That there is a, a really a small nation, a small people, it's nothing. So related uh, to those big empires, Egypt and Assyria and Babylon and then later Persia, uh, this people is a small uh, nation without power, also the territory was a small territory and the numbers, everything is small. And then uh, they, uh, are, uh, they are there uh, on the table of world history with these uh, enormous empires. They can have the feeling that we are nothing. We are so small. We are uh, a little uh, like a dust uh, uh, which can be thrown away in a minute uh, by these great powers. And then there is an interpretation which says that uh, no, it is not uh, about us. It is about our Lord, uh, who is more powerful than anybody else. There is no other God who could compete with him. And uh, this big king, who is so very powerful, related to our power and possibilities, is, however, in the same way and nothing, just, uh, just the dust related to the power of uh, our Lord. So, from verse uh, 7, uh, we uh, go further, saying, All nations will serve him and his son and his grandson until the time for his land comes. The time for his land. It will be ended if God, if the Lord decides to end. Then many nations and great kings will subjugate him. If, however, any nation or kingdom will not serve Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, or bow its neck under his yoke, you understand? These words are told by Jeremiah, who has this yoke on his neck. I will punish that nation with the sword, famine and plague declares the Lord, until I destroy it by his hand. So do not listen to your prophets, your diviners, your interpreters of dreams, your mediums or your scorcerers who tell you, you will not serve the king of Babylon. They prophesy lies to you that will only serve to remove you far from your lands. I will banish you and you will perish. You understand? There are official prophets, the prophets who were turned uh, from uh, mediators, representants of the Lord to their people. They were changed to be uh, uh, representants uh, uh, of the existing power, of the existing state, of the existing religion. And they uh, prophesy lies. They are false prophets. And then comes the real prophet saying that uh, these are liars. That is uh, not the reality. That is not what the Lord uh, says you. 
because what did uh, uh, these uh, false prophets say? Uh, they naturally said, uh, which, uh, uh, which was sympathetic uh, uh, to the ears uh, of the king and of the high priest, saying that the Lord will come uh, and save you, and uh, uh, you will uh, have victory uh, over Nebuchadnezzar. And also, you can imagine uh, what a horrible tension this must have been to say something which, uh, well, how could it be interpreted uh, by the official authorities? That this Jeremiah was a traitor, perhaps even he might have been a, a, a spy of the Babylonians, a fifth scholar, this person uh, should be killed, shouldn't he? Because uh, he tells uh, the most horrible things uh, instead of giving uh, some consonance, uh, or instead of saying that uh, let's uh, try to collect all our uh, strengths uh, and, uh, and uh, struggle against uh, Babylon. So, let's go further. But if any nation will bow its neck under the yoke of the king of Babylon and serve him, I will let that nation remain in its own land uh, to till it and to live there, declares the Lord. I gave the same message to Zedekiah, king of Judah. The same message. Jeremiah says what the Lord told him to say. I said, Bow your neck under the, yoke, under the yoke of the king of Babylon. Serve him and his people and you will live. Why will you and your people die by the sword, famine and plague with which the Lord has threatened any nation that will not serve the king of Babylon? Do not listen to the words of the prophets who say to you, You will not serve the king of Babylon, for they are prophesying lies to you prophesying lies to you. I have not sent them, the false prophets, declares the Lord. They are prophesying lies in my name. Therefore I will banish you and you will perish, both you and the prophets who prophesy, uh, prophesied to you. Then I said to the priests and all these people, you can imagine the situation, Jeremiah is there, and there are all the, uh, the most powerful uh, state and, uh, and church authorities, uh, we could say, with today's words. So then I said to the priests and all these people, this is what the Lord says. Do not listen to the prophets who say, very soon now the articles from the Lord's house will be brought back from Babylon. They are prophesying lies to you. Do not listen to them, etc., etc. And then uh, this quarrel will go over, uh, about which we can read in the 28th chapter of this book uh, uh, of, uh, of Jeremiah. And uh, uh, the, uh, the consequence uh, of which will be uh, that uh, Jeremiah will be in, uh, will be in jail uh, and uh, even almost dies. And in fact, uh, what we know about the life of Jeremiah is uh, uh, that uh, when, uh, when, uh, when uh, Jerusalem uh, is occupied, uh, then uh, those who flee to Egypt uh, they take with themselves uh, uh, Jeremiah, and we do not know what was uh, the end of his uh, uh, life. And then now let's uh, move uh, further, also historically further, because uh, this all was uh, what happened before the Babylonian captivity, about which I told you that uh, this made possible for the people uh, not to lose all hope, not, uh, not to say, not to come uh, to the consequence uh, that our God was not strong enough. No, the prophets gave uh, the interpretation that this was the decision of our Lord and it was the just, the righteous uh, decision, judgment uh, of God because uh, you were unfaithful. 
So, what happens uh, is that uh, at the beginning of the 6th uh, century before Christ, uh, in uh, three different times, uh, uh, Jerusalem uh, is really uh, occupied and plundered uh, by uh, the Babylonians, and uh, uh, the ruling class, uh, so the, uh, the higher layers of the society, are really taken into captivity uh, in uh, Babylon. It is important to understand that it didn't mean that everybody, uh, the, the, the simple people, all of uh, deported. No, it, were, it was the ruling class, uh, behind which there was a, a, a political thinking, a possible political thinking, saying that if there is no ruling uh, layer of the society, then that society will not be able to revolt, uh, to struggle against uh, our uh, power. This is why these people are taken into the Babylonian captivity, which did not mean that these people were in jail uh, or they were in a very bad situation. No, it cannot be said. They had the possibility uh, to live uh, in or around, not very far away, even from the capital, and to make uh, their life. However, with uh, the horrible uh, consciousness that everything is ending. This is important, uh, again, to understand that uh, for the then thinking, the real subject uh, of human life is not the individual. It's not you or the other or the third person, but it is the nation. So, uh, when we say that somebody has a, 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 the, a, the death fear, when we have a fear that we die, which is a horrible thing, now, this uh, uh, we do not see, uh, uh, at least uh, except for the last uh, uh, books uh, of the Old Testament, I mean uh, the books uh, which were written at the end of the Old Testament period, except for these ones, uh, you do not uh, uh, read texts which would speak about this sort uh, of fear, but it is full with texts uh, uh, that shout, that cry uh, for the horrible fear that the people, that the nation, that they will perish. And this is, uh, which is, uh, it seems, uh, realized uh, in the exile uh, in, uh, in uh, Babylon. So we could say that uh, what happens uh, then after about uh, two generations, 70 years, it is said, but it depends on from uh, which uh, occasion of the occupation uh, of Jerusalem we begin it uh, to count. Uh, so anyway, there are two generations uh, after which uh, they have a permission to come back, but it means that they could preserve their face, their identity as a, a nation. And we could say that uh, this is, uh, in a sense, uh, a miracle. I could say uh, number two historic uh, miracle. What was the number one miracle? It was, if you remember, uh, when this nomadic people settled down uh, in, uh, in the Holy Land, in Palestine or Israel, as you want, uh, then uh, it would have been absolutely inevitable that they are assimilated to the more developed culture and the culture meant also religion. And you remember we said that uh, what happens is uh, that uh, this nomad, no nomadic uh, tribe and this nomadic god, Yahweh, will be able to begin to assimilate into himself uh, uh, what they met there uh, in the fertile land, uh, in, uh, in the Holy Land. Well, this was uh, the miracle number one. And then uh, here we have the miracle number two, that, uh, that uh, when their Lord seems to be uh, weak, then they understand that he's not weak, but he is even much stronger than they thought they could uh, uh, be. Uh, so, um, this uh, is possible only 
if uh, they go further on the road uh, of, uh, of admiring uh, the power of their Lord, where the, uh, the uh, uh, essential idea was that Nebuchadnezzar, just like then later Cyrus and the Persian kings, they all are only instruments in the hand of the Lord, who is the Lord of history. So, uh, what historically will happen is uh, that uh, they become a permission uh, to go back uh, to the Holy Land. Uh, this came uh, historically, we could say, that this happened because uh, the Persian Empire uh, occupies uh, uh, the Babylonian Empire, a new Babylonian uh, Empire, and uh, the political strategy uh, of uh, the Persians uh, was different from that of the Babylonians. The Babylonians uh, wanted to mix up people and uh, to, to uh, exterminate the possibility of a revolt against their power, while uh, the idea of the Persians was uh, that uh, uh, if uh, the people uh, who, be, who belong into our, uh, to our uh, empire will be happy, then uh, they will not have a cause uh, to revolt. Up until today, these are different possibilities uh, how to tackle, uh, by a great power, uh, the people who are subjugated uh, uh, to uh, his power. So, that was the policy of uh, the Persian Empire, and so they said, okay, uh, you can go home, uh, you can re-begin your life. That will happen, really, at the end of the 6th century before Christ, and uh, what they do there is uh, far away from what they had before. It is not uh, an independent state. Uh, it is uh, much smaller than their country was before. It is much poorer. In fact, in all respects, uh, uh, they are less powerful uh, than before. However, they can exist. And they will be able uh, to preserve their identity because a new type of religiosity will be born there. This new form of religiosity will be absolutely concentrated around the law. So we could say that the picture what we can make about uh, the Jewish religion from the New Testament, uh, from the quarrels between Jesus uh, and uh, the Pharisees uh, and the scribes, uh, that is in fact the type of religiosity which uh, 500 years earlier was formed after the Jews came back to the Holy Land uh, from uh, the captivity. What was the essence uh, uh, in the thinking, in the feelings, uh, in the soul of the people? What was the essence uh, of this sort of answer? It was saying that uh, uh, they, uh, uh, they said yes to the prophets. They said, uh, yes, they had right. It was uh, our unfaithfulness which brought about the punishment uh, of our Lord. So, in order to avoid that uh, another such historical tragedy happens to us, uh, we must be faithful. And how can we be faithful? If we observe the law. If we observe every little word of the law. And then there will be a development uh, in which uh, they more and more earnestly will try to observe the law. What will happen is that there will be a continuous thinking about how to interpret the law, how uh, we should uh, uh, observe the law in this situation or that situation, and what if, and then uh, a, whole, uh, uh, a whole type, a style of thinking will be formed for the Jews, uh, which is, we could say, in a sense, up until today is very, very characteristic. So that sort of a very, uh, very differentiated thinking, 
that sort of ethical thinking uh, which tries to go always, always uh, uh, more into depth and uh, also trying uh, uh, to make clear every little uh, detail, asking what is right and what is wrong, meaning what is according to the law of God and what is against it, this sort of thinking will be there, uh, that will be uh, produced by this situation and by this sort uh, of fear. And here it is important to see uh, that there is a, uh, a sort uh, uh, of, uh, of really unbelievable uh, uh, earnest uh, uh, moral strength behind this sort of development. Uh, with all their strengths uh, to try uh, to observe uh, the law. On the other hand, this will has as a consequence uh, that their religion will become really very stiff, very stubborn. It will be the absolute opposite of what was characteristic uh, for this religion before. Uh, what, uh, 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 what we could follow up uh, until this point, speaking about the Old Testament, uh, that was all something very, very uh, living. Uh, uh, at every, uh, every new situation, new ideas, uh, uh, changes, uh, uh, always, uh, always going with the time. Uh, now, uh, what will happen here is uh, to, f uh, to try to find very, very firm grounding, uh, to, uh, to, make, uh, uh, to make firm uh, everything in the religion in order to be able to observe it. And that's, that will be behind uh, all those quarrels uh, in uh, the New Testament. Uh, yes, sir. and then uh, let's go uh, further to one more text uh, in uh, the book uh, of uh, Jeremiah. Uh, no, 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 no. You might know, my dear students, that uh, there is one more person in our group, the only one who is uh, really present here, uh, which is... Uh, uh, which is a colleague of mine uh, who is listening to this uh, uh, to this lecture, and which makes much more easy for me to speak as if uh, you were here. And now I will ask him, uh, uh, how long have I been uh, speaking now? Do you know when? Uh, one, one hour. One hour. So we have yeah. another half an hour. Very good. Okay. So uh, is this our part, which would be Jeremiah? Yes, sir. Uh, chapter thirty-one, verses uh, from seven uh, to uh, fourteen. Uh, so this is what the Lord says: Sing with joy for Jacob. Shout for the foremost of the nations. Make your praises heard and say, Lord, save your people, the remnant uh, of Israel. See, I will bring them from the land of the north and gather them from the ends uh, of the earth. Among them will be the blind and the lame, expectant mothers uh, and women in labor. A great throng will return. They will come with weeping. They will pray as I bring them back. I will lead them beside streams of water on a level path where they will not stumble, because I am Israel's father, and Ephraim is my firstborn son. Now what you see here is the more fantastic that it is in the same way from the book of Jeremiah, and more or less we can say that it, uh, it really uh, seems to be um, realistic that uh, Jeremiah's activity uh, was partly before the captivity and partly after the captivity. And then what was the message conveyed uh, by Jeremiah before the captivity? It was the harshest, uh, uh, almost brutal uh, way of uh, speaking about the judgment, 
with all that vision that all those horrible things uh, will happen to you and the Lord will punish you because of what you did. And then when it happens, the tragedy is there, they are really in exile, and then it is the absolute opposite of what the prophet will say. In that situation, the prophets will speak about hope. They will speak about uh, a future when the Lord will bring back uh, his people. They will speak about a situation uh, where that sort of uh, uh, religious life and social life will uh, be realized what they ought to have realized before, but they didn't. And that's why there was the punishment. So, anyway, uh, it means that after uh, the prophecies uh, with that horrible, strong critic, in this situation now comes uh, uh, the prophecy about uh, hope and uh, uh, future. This says, this says God will save his people and bring back them to the Holy Land. Why can they say this? They can say this because there is a model for that. That was the fundamental experience of the Jewish people, beginning with Egypt, that from an absolutely hopeless situation, they were saved, they were liberated, they were driven out from Egypt. And then again and again this was what happened, and as I told you, uh, the whole story about Egypt uh, and the rescue from Egypt, uh, that was really a model. And they, uh, they understood, they read what happened to them in the history, always uh, through this, this class, through this, this model. And uh, so it was prepared for this situation which was uh, uh, the greatest tra tragedy uh, since the times of Egypt. And then again they can say that when they are in the deepest suffering, in the worst situation in their history, then again God will, uh, with strong hand, uh, drive them out uh, from uh, the suffering, uh, from the captivity uh, in uh, Babylon. It is also important, uh, there is uh, this uh, new concept that the remnant uh, of Israel, that uh, there were many uh, who were dispersed, there were many uh, who, uh, who, who have fallen out uh, of uh, this covenant, but the covenant between God and the people, it is not over, because uh, the guarant, uh, the warrant of uh, that covenant is not what the people do, but what God does. It means that uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, in last resort, uh, the basis of the relation between God and his people is not what the people do, but it is what God is like. And God is merciful, and God loves uh, his people. Just let, uh, let, us, uh, uh, let us see what, uh, what we, uh, we read here. Uh, we read, uh, uh, yes, uh, up until verse... Uh, uh, hear the word of uh, the Lord, you nations, Proclaim it in distant coastlands. He who scattered Israel will gather them and will watch over his flock like a shepherd. It's the same Lord who scattered Israel as a punishment and now will gather them and uh, be their shepherd. For the Lord will deliver Jacob and redeem them from the hand of those stronger than they. Yes, they are stronger than the small people, but God is stronger than the stronger ones. They will come and shout for joy on the heights of Zion. They will rejoice in the bounty of the Lord, 
the grain, the new wine and the olive oil, the young of the flocks and the herds. They will be like a well-watered garden, and they will sorrow no more. Then young women will dance and be glad, young men and old as well. I will turn their mourning into gladness. I will give them comfort and joy instead of sorrow. I will satisfy the priests with abundance, and my people will be filled with my bounty, declares the Lord. Uh, yes. And then I think here there is a point uh, which, uh, which we cannot, uh, uh, cannot spare us not to speak about uh, because, uh, because uh, uh, some of you uh, come from Arab countries uh, and, uh, and uh, we know uh, that this situation, uh, this prophecy uh, has something to do with the actual situation. Uh, which is a dramatic situation uh, in this part of the world. Uh, and uh, uh, as I told you, in order to avoid uh, that wars go on forever, uh, it is the number one thing to do to try to understand the other, the other person, the other nation, why he thinks according uh, uh, to ideas uh, uh, which, uh, which he thinks. So we could say that uh, uh, knowing uh, all the wounds that uh, Israel as a state uh, made against Arabic people, especially Palestinian people, uh, just uh, uh, try to imagine uh, how uh, this, uh, this prophecy uh, and other prophecies, there are quite a number of them uh, uh, in the Old Testament, what they mean for the Jewish people. It meant for them uh, that two and a half thousand years ago they could go back uh, uh, to the land from which uh, they were driven out. And this again uh, was for them uh, uh, a miracle, a similar miracle to that uh, which happened in Egypt. And then when in the second century after Christ, after the so-called Bar Kokhba uh, revolt against uh, the Roman Empire, they had to, uh, to leave uh, uh, the Holy Land. All the Jews uh, had to leave uh, at least uh, in Jerusalem, not, not a single Jew was allowed to live in Jerusalem. And in fact, uh, 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 they almost all left uh, the Holy Land. And then almost 2,000 years uh, passed by. And after 2,000 years, uh, they thought uh, that they, uh, they, uh, uh, they, they can again uh, live this situation, what they uh, read here about that they can go back uh, to, their, uh, to their land. And then uh, what is on the other side? On the other side, yes, uh, you have the Palestinians who were living there for thousands of years, who had uh, their, uh, their land, their home uh, there. And then in the middle of the 20th century, there are people coming and saying that this is our land. This is very understandably uh, exactly the situation uh, which you would have if somebody would come into my house and saying that uh, this is my bedroom, this is my kitchen, this, is all, this all belongs to me. This is really a horrible situation. And uh, one thing uh, which is really important to see is that uh, uh, there is something understandable on both sides. I do not think uh, we can go into any details concerning politics, uh, concerning the actual situation in Israel and around with Palestine and, uh, and all these things. Uh, I think, however, that if we are here now in Budapest, uh, uh, now uh, uh, understanding uh, uh, Budapest not uh, simply as uh, the capital of Hungary, but of uh, a European country, a European town, I think the only honest thing to say is that uh, if you want to look for who is responsible for that terrible situation, 
which uh, has been there for decades now uh, in Israel, uh, no doubt it is there the Western civilization. It was the Western civilization which created a situation uh, where, uh, where Jews were persecuted in such a way that they didn't see any other possibility than to try to flee and to say, then, then let's try as a last possibility to go back into our land. I say again, I do not want to give uh, any, uh, any answer what could be uh, uh, the good answer to this uh, tension. But I think, uh, as somebody from the Western civilization, uh, I can only say, uh, dear uh, Arab and Jewish uh, people, that uh, it is our responsibility and it is our sin uh, what happened and uh, what happens uh, uh, to you and I can uh, hope only and pray uh, to God uh, for that uh, a solution be found to this situation a solution without uh, war a solution without the deaths of thousands and ten thousands of people a solution uh, which can be accepted uh, by uh, both uh, partners Yes, and then let's uh, go back uh, to uh, the prophet uh, Isaiah, from whom uh, we shall uh, read come, 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 come. chapter number 49. Verses uh, from 7 to 23. Uh, now, before reading the text, uh, there is an important thing which I have to tell you, uh, which is uh, that according to, uh, to research, uh, it is uh, more or less, uh, uh, it can be taken for sure, that uh, the prophecies which were collected in the book of Isaiah uh, were not all coming uh, from the same person, even not uh, from the same period uh, of uh, time. Uh, this doesn't mean that there was some, che some cheating uh, uh, for modern thinking. Uh, if you have uh, a book under someone's name uh, and it was not uh, written by he or she, then you would say, I splag him, uh, it's a sin, uh, he has to be punished. It is very far away uh, from the thinking uh, of, uh, of, the, uh, of these, these times, where it was evident uh, that if there was a text uh, which uh, uh, for the image uh, of the time uh, was uh, in harmony which, uh, with uh, some important person uh, or with an existing collection of writings, let's say the writings, the prophecies of Isaiah, then uh, they put there saying that this also is the prophecy of Isaiah. So this is uh, what happened uh, with many of the books uh, of the Bible, not all of them, but with a lot of books, uh, both the Old and the New Testament. Now this is the case uh, uh, with uh, the book uh, of Isaiah and uh, we could say uh, that uh, in the scientific interpretation uh, of this book uh, we speak about uh, Isaiah, then we speak about Deutero Isaiah and we speak about Trito Isaiah. So first, second and third uh, Isaiah. And more or less uh, we can say that uh, the first 44 chapters uh, of uh, the books uh, of the collection which we have as the book of uh, Isaiah, they come uh, from the first Isaiah, who lived uh, much before uh, the captivity, and then we have uh, the chapters uh, uh, from uh, 40, uh, uh, 45, uh, uh, there come uh, to, 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 to 55, uh, which are uh, uh, the, the, book, uh, the, the chapters uh, which uh, uh, are said to belong uh, to uh, the uh, to Deuteronomy Isaiah, who lived after 
the captivity. And uh, shortly we could say that in a sense, uh, as far as the theological thinking uh, is concerned, uh, it is, uh, it is uh, uh, the top, the end uh, of, uh, the, uh, uh, of the development uh, in the, the uh, Old uh, Testament. So anyway, uh, we shall uh, have here uh, two texts from Deutero-Isaiah, oh, even three. Uh, so I do not need, know how far we shall have enough time uh, to read all of them. But uh, let's begin here uh, from verse uh, 7. This is what uh, the Lord uh, says, uh, the Redeemer and Holy One uh, of uh, Israel, uh, to him who was despised and abhorred by the nation, to the servant of rulers. Kings will see you and stand up, princes will see and bow down because of the Lord who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel, who has chosen you. This is what the Lord says. In the time of my favor I will answer you, and in the day of salvation I will help you. I will keep you and will make you to be a covenant for the people, to restore the land and to reassign its desolate inheritances. To say to the captives, come out. And to those in darkness, be free. They will feed beside the roads and find pasture on every barn, barn hill. They will neither hunger nor thirst, nor will the desert heat and the sun beat down on them. He who has compassion on them will guide them and lead them beside springs of water. I will turn all my mountains into roads and my highways will be raised up. So it is uh, in fact uh, rather similar uh, to the previous uh, uh, text uh, which we consulted, uh, the prophecy of, uh, of uh, uh, Jeremiah. Uh, one new element here uh, which we shall we must see is uh, that, uh, that uh, here uh, we hear about somebody uh, uh, who uh, will uh, be uh, who will be somehow a conveyor uh, of uh, uh, the will uh, of uh, the Lord. In the time of my favor, I will answer you, and in the day of salvation, I will help you. I will keep you and will uh, make you to be a covenant for the people. But to whom does speak uh, the Lord here through the mouth uh, of the prophet? Is it the people itself? But then why can he say that uh, you will be a covenant for the people? So in fact, uh, uh, what you begin to see here is uh, that there will be uh, somebody, some person, who will convey uh, uh, the will of God to the people. Somebody who First, we would say, is like a prophet, but he seems to be something more than a prophet. Not just in the same way somebody into whose mouth there are put the words of Lord to convey it to the people, but somebody with an even higher uh, rank, uh, representing uh, the Lord toward uh, his people in a much uh, uh, more uh, substantial capacity. Now this is uh, uh, what we shall see in the 5th the third uh, chapter of the book of uh, Isaiah, which is uh, one of the most important uh, parts uh, of the whole of, uh, of uh, the Bible. Now, I was speaking about uh, some person, some conveyor of uh, the will of God, uh, some, in fact, somebody who will realize the will of God, who will be called the Messiah. The Messiah uh, who uh, will realize the will uh, of God. Uh, 
I do not know how far we can say this, uh, but uh, preparing for this lecture, I had a faint idea, which I hardly dare to tell you, uh, but knowing uh, that uh, here are you also coming from Tunisia and Morocco and Saudi Arabia and Turkey, I would say that uh, in a sense it's a little similar uh, to the person of Mohammed in Islam. Uh, whom you say, uh, Muhammad, uh, Rasul, uh, Allah, uh, uh, do you corrected uh, my pronunciation the last time, uh, but uh, if, I under, if I know it well, unfortunately uh, you are not here uh, to, to have the possibility to say, no, no, professor, it's nonsense, it's not like that. Uh, but I hope uh, uh, it is uh, fundamentally uh, right that uh, uh, Muhammad is not one prophet uh, of uh, God, but it is the prophet. He is on a much higher rank than any, other, than, than any other prophets were. In Islam thinking, I think that is like that. There were prophets who represented God uh, in important respects, but uh, it is uh, uh, in a much higher capacity that Muhammad uh, uh, represents uh, Allah uh, for the people. Now, in a sense, uh, we could say uh, that here, when the idea of the Messiah is born, uh, uh, a similar movement happens that uh, there will be seen somebody uh, who will not simply be uh, a prophet, though the prophets were very, very important, but something uh, on an even uh, higher ranking. So, it's all right, then uh, what you would say, damn, probably he will be a fantastic man, uh, won't he? Uh, he will be uh, more clever than anybody else, he will be more powerful than anybody else, he will be beautiful and uh, everything like that. That should be the number one representative of the Lord, uh, shouldn't be. And then what do we read here? Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering, and familiar with pain, like one from whom people hide their faces. He was despised, and we held him in low esteem. Now I think this is really hardly believable, but when the idea comes uh, that there will be a, a real instrument uh, of the realization of the will of God, he will not be at the highest point according to human thinking, but he will be somebody who will suffer. He will be not beautiful, but ugly. He will be sick, and we can read a lot of similar uh, characterizations uh, about the Messiah. This is, uh, yes, I can, uh, I could hardly believe how, how anybody, according to human thinking, could have, could have arrived uh, to this uh, sort uh, of uh, thinking. He is not uh, a superman, but the opposite. And not only is he the opposite, but he will not be understood even by those uh, who are the nearest to him. The text doesn't say that there are stupid people, there are those uh, who are not believers, who are not faithful, and they will uh, not understand him, and they will not see that he is beautiful. No, what we read was uh, uh, that uh, we held him in low esteem. Not they, not the others, not the baddies, but we, we all held him in low esteem. And then we go further, reading, surely he took up our pain and bore
bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. Now, uh, this is uh, considered uh, to be, in fact, uh, the last step between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Uh, we shall see that uh, in these verses uh, we have uh, quite a great part uh, of uh, what is the essence of Christology, of the Christian uh, uh, thinking about uh, Jesus Christ. Uh, so, what we, uh, what we read here is that the person through whom it is possible uh, salvation, uh, through him uh, it is possible uh, that the people come out uh, from uh, uh, the, the tragedy, uh, from suffering, from sins, that is a person who has uh, to suffer, who suffers instead of the people. Let's go further. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. So our sins, our iniquity, iniquities, and the punishment, the just punishment of our sins is on him. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so did he not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. Yet who of his generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living, for the transgression of my people he was punished. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. So, it means that it is God himself, the Lord, whose, whose will it was that this all happens to his chosen person, now not the chosen people, the chosen one, the only one, the Messiah, and it was his, the Lord's will, that uh, this all happens uh, which uh, we were speaking uh, before. I do not see, uh, think we have very much time, so I think... Uh, so, a last uh, part we shall read from, uh, uh, from Isaiah uh, chapter 55. from verse, uh, verses uh, 6 to 12, uh, which will be interesting uh, because uh, it, uh, it uh, demonstrates uh, us something uh, of uh, which point was reached in this whole development uh, of the Old Testament thinking. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake their ways and uh, the unrighteous their thoughts. Let him turn to the Lord and he will have mercy on them. And to our God, 
for he will freely pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. As the rain and the snow come down from the heaven, and do not return to it without watering the earth, and making it bud and flourish, so that it yields seed for the sour and breed for the eater, so is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which uh, I sent it. You will go out in joy and be led forth in peace. The mountains and hills will burst into a song before you, and all the trees of the field will clap their hands. Instead of the thorn bush, bush will grow the juniper, and instead of briars the myrtle will grow. This will be for the Lord's renown, for an everlasting sign that will endure forever. Just in a very short uh, uh, sentence, uh, to put together, uh, in a sense, uh, almost everything what we were speaking uh, in the four, uh, so yes, or the four classes which we have about the Old Testament is, uh, we said that normally religion is concentrated on something that happened in the past, usually in the mythical past, in the golden age, that is uh, in the core of religion. What happens uh, in uh, the Old Testament religion is uh, that God ever more will become the God not only of the past but of the present. Somebody who speaks now, who has uh, his uh, conveyors, the prophets, to speak uh, today to his people. And then also he is the Lord of the future, who will bring his people from the suffering to the Holy Land, etc., etc. And then one more point what you have here is uh, that even about uh, what will happen in the future does not speak the prophet. He doesn't say here what will do the Lord. He says uh, his ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. We do not know what God will do in the future. What we know is only that we can and we have to trust God, who is the God of past, present and future. That was for today and then uh, I hope you will be able uh, to look at this video uh, today uh, in the Goodbye.